Now Micah Miller trying to spring a pass ahead. Nobody in front of Jack Paling. Moves on with a blast and scores! Jack Paling! We aren't giving up on chances, and we just got to bottom line execute. Waits, waits, passes the front. Great save, Pelosi, as she robs a gopher in front of her in that one was number eight, Kippen Keller, on the great A opportunity. When you're the coach, that's the kind of D you're always looking for because uh, they don't grow on trees for sure, and, and he's done a really good job being a captain of a really young team this year. It was a really cool thing to see for them to uh, really appreciate what I've done on and off the ice. Through the far half wall, Jack Paling trying to play it into the corner. Now Paling turns, squares his body to the slot, sends it up high toward Jack. And Sean makes his play through. Welcome back, Husky Warmer Nels podcast fans. We are at episode number 41. Thank you again for joining us on this week's episode. We have a couple of outstanding women's hockey players to join us to talk about their life through COVID, pre-COVID, and the first half of the women's hockey season. We'll dive into plenty of topics in Center Ice View news and notes, and then a couple of announcements as well. Uh, joining me, Noah Grant. I'm Nick Maxson. Uh, Noah, in the wasteland, badlands that some Husky fans are calling North Dakota, We'll get into why everybody's so sour about that state here in just a little bit. Uh, but uh, it, it's a Thursday night. We're recording a day early because, again, the Huskies will be facing off tomorrow night against Colorado College. Again, the first meeting of the season since game one was canceled. It was supposed to be game number two in the pod for the Huskies. That game, again, slated to be rescheduled and made up sometime in the travel part of the season. That has yet to be announced. But, uh, uh, Noah, how are things going? Yeah, two games left uh, in the pod for the Huskies. Looking forward to that and looking forward to the second half of the women's hockey season, which is hopefully uh, tentatively set right now, as we would say. Uh, speaking of things that are tentatively set, Nick, um, I'm wearing glasses right now, but they're just blue light glasses. I found out yesterday that I have to, uh, speaking of that driving test that we had talked about a couple of weeks earlier, uh, I actually have to legitimately get glasses. I spent $500 on a new pair of glasses. So I am officially aging. I think it's, I'm starting to become you slowly, but surely. And I, I don't like it. I, I don't want it. <laughs> can I, can't, uh, I, I don't get back those. I, I would trust me if I could, I would. <laughs> um, no, actually I would take your youth and then give you all my aging. So uh, yeah. Welcome to the club there, bro. So uh, it's, it's, it's never fun. It's just all gets downhill from here. Uh, but we do have some announcements, Noah, besides uh, the $500 worth of glasses slash, you know, whatever the heck is going on with your vision problems. Uh, we have been uh, launched a feedback part of our website uh, last week. Uh, we read every single comment and uh, we appreciate every one of your folks' input. This is the show for you guys. So, you know, without our fans and our listeners, Listeners, our watchers on YouTube, uh, we wouldn't be where we got right now. And I will, the, basically, the thing that we'll tell you folks is that we received a lot of positive feedback. We've received some suggestions. And uh, essentially, you're going to be going through some of those suggestions to make the show better. We'll be kind of making some tweaks, I would say, probably after the first of the year. So we're kind of diving through about how we can execute some of those. But I think uh, that's essentially, a, 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 first of all, a lot of good feedback uh, so far from mm -hmm. our listeners. You know, I, and there's some things too um, that you might might start to see uh, either last week or this week kind of implemented. Like for example, uh, one of the requests was to start to kind of put timestamps within the the show notes. Essentially, when you go on uh, like Apple Podcasts and you're reading through uh, what the show is going to be about that week, adding timestamps there. So we're trying to get better at that, and we appreciate that feedback. Uh, Nick, the one that I think we should highlight here, uh, and that we're not highlighting this just because you know we feel like singling this comment out. It's one that we have legitimately gone back and forth with a little bit here as far as um, how we try to set up the show. So a little bit about, um, I guess, maybe starting with how we kind of set up the show and why we do the show the way that we do. Um, to start off, we're obviously in the beginning segment of the show, which is kind of where we introduce, you know, how our weeks are going, any sort of housekeeping, things like that, including trivia, any giveaways, that sort of thing. That kind of encompasses the first 10, 15 minutes of the show, give or take, depending on the week that we've had. Uh, after that uh, is Centerized View News and Notes, which is essentially switching gears to the bulk of what's going on in the world of hockey, uh, specifically St. Cloud hockey, but, you know, the state of Minnesota and anything that pertains to what we think is relevant to you as listeners. So we definitely enjoy hearing feedback about that. We We've heard that uh, that section has been getting better and better every week, which makes us feel really good because 
we know that not everybody is a, you know, a Colorado avalanche fan or wants to hear about hockey in Russia, but if we can make it interesting enough for you, that's our goal along with providing you some great Huskies hockey content, which moves into our next section of the show, which obviously is our interview. And we hope to bring you a variety of interview guests uh, that have some ties to St. Cloud state hockey in one way or another for current players, coaches, personnel, alumni. Uh, we love to bring as many people in as we can. We've had some requests for a little bit more alumni. Uh, we do work really hard to make sure we have a, do, a really good diversity of guests. Uh, alumni, the challenge with that is simply uh, ease of access with players that we have uh, like Rachel Herzog, Emma Paluzny, Hannah Bates, uh, a little bit easier to contact. So we have put requests in for certain players, uh, but it, we have to work with their timelines too. So rest assured, we are trying to get uh, some of the older generations on here as well. And then after our interview, uh, we kind of shoot for about 15 to 25 minutes or so of just kind of an in-depth topic that we feel is pertinent or relevant for the week. So our goal, our goal is kind of to give you uh, these segments of about 20 to 40 minutes, give or take, depending on the segment where we switch gears and give you enough variety that you can listen to bits and pieces of it, or you can listen to it all at once. With that being said, here's where the feedback comes in, Nick. Uh, and we did have, uh, we've, it's not the first time we've heard this. We've had some people request that the interview section, which generally runs about maybe 35, 40 minutes to maybe 50 minutes or so, somewhere in that range, uh, be separate from the rest of the show. So, so essentially, centerized view, news and notes, our trivia drawings, everything else in the show, and then our hot topic of the day, if you will, um, be one show about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes long, and then the interview be released at a different point during the week. Uh, and so Nick and I talked about this pre-show, and I think what might be best here, Nick, uh, is maybe we'll put out a poll for maybe about the next week and kind of see, uh, maybe we'll open it up Saturday. Saturday, maybe Saturday or Sunday. Uh, so look for that poll. And we just kind of want to know, is this, is this an idea that people support that you feel uh, it would be more appropriate for us to um, kind of separate the nuts and bolts of the show, if you will, kind of the, the news portion of the show. And then the guest portion of the show, do you want those split into two separate episodes during the week that come out at the same time? every week or do you want it as is right now with just one continuous show and even if you want one continuous show do you want the format change do you want the interview to be the very first thing you hear in the show or the very last thing of the show let us know um we are more than welcome to hear your feedback and it has been really helpful we really appreciate it also um i don't know if we'll add a separate section for this nick but it's also a good place too if you have a listener question and you're not feeling like you want to dm us or put that out on twitter but you want a question that you want to ask anonymously on twitter or, or for the show I should say, uh, you can ask that as well too. Feedback can also be listener questions as well. So uh, just another way for you to get in touch with us and for us to, uh, like like Nick mentioned, this show is uh, for our listeners and kind of we try to tailor it to the listeners because we want you to enjoy our product and you're the reason that we keep coming back and doing this uh, every week. Nick, before I kick it back to you, speaking of that, uh, why we get up and do this every week. I, it made me think of this story. This happened today, like you mentioned, Thursday, December 17th. Uh, about a week ago, my dog passed away. We put him down a week ago. Uh, Steve McDonald, head coach of the women's hockey team, reached out to me today and uh, gave me condolences for the passing of my dog and had a nice conversation with me about that. Um, and, and I know that that seems just like a general, like, Oh, thank you. But you got to realize I'm seven and a half hours away from Steve and Steve definitely doesn't have to do anything like that. So I really wanted to say um, kudos and thank you to Steve. It means a lot for him to uh, reach out and say something like that. So um, Nick, I have no idea how you feel like you're going to transition out of that, but I wish you the best of luck in said transition. Uh, you know, I think at the end of it, again, you know, we, we appreciate every listener. We appreciate every viewer that we get on this show. It's a big reason why we keep doing this. Um, I'd rather be drinking a beer sometimes uh, than doing this. Uh, <laughs> but again, hockey always uh, goes number one. Um, I guess the only thing I will say is, you know, if there's anything new, I, you know, after hating on it, I, I will tell you this, Noah, the jersey's kind of, you know, I've always said the only problem I've had it was this. Now it's kind of grown on me a little bit. For no. those for those who are listening to the audio version, Nick is pointing at his new Minnesota Wild reverse retro jersey. For those who are listening, so it's a new addition to the backdrop. I'm going to be making some backdrop changes uh, over the next uh, little bit, and I think you will be doing some backdrop changes as yes. well. But that's going to be something again, maybe for the uh, new year per se. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, excited to do some changes as well in the background. But uh, one thing that hasn't changed, and one thing that we do continuously every week, is our trivia. And yep. Noah, I'll kick it right back to you for those to get caught up on last week's trivia. 
Two Line Fan Trivia is your chance to win. Follow the Huskies Warming House podcast on Twitter at Warming House Den. A new question will be asked every week. Be the first to tweet us the correct answer. Winners will be mentioned on the show, as well as a chance for prizes and more. One question, one answer, one winner. It's Two Line Trivia. Nick, two-line fan trivia, of course, uh, if you're listening when this episode first comes out around Saturday, December 19th, that will be our last trivia for the year. So the following weekend, uh, which is Christmas weekend, December 25th and 26th, we will not have a trivia question that week just because it's Christmas and we kind of want to take a break. And probably I'm guessing most of you won't be looking at your phones and we'll probably be spending time with family uh, at that time. But uh, we got to spend some time with a colleague and friend of ours in Rachel Herzog uh, last week, all but fight the pants with were eligible also can someone explain to me what that handle actually means like fight the pants i got about like 10 different things i think immediately like do you have any idea what that means like can we ask i I would like to ask him yeah uh (laughs) just because i mean there's so many different rabbit holes that you could go under maybe it's a movie quote maybe it's you know maybe an inside joke with some other people um, but I'm curious to know. I, I really I really wonder how PG it was. But anyway, uh, Rachel <laughs> Herzog was generally uh, fairly PG with us last week. Uh, in her senior season for the St. Cloud State women's hockey team, she played in all 35 contests. That year, she led her team in what statistical category? Nick, I'm almost certain that you know this, but uh, um, fire Block away. shots. Block shots, yeah. Um, second place once again, solely belongs to Tanner Heath on the two line fan trivia leaderboard. That leaderboard, like we mentioned, will be up in, well, I should say updated one more time before the end of 2020. So we'll see if that second place will still solely belong to Tanner Heath. Uh, one thing that definitely first place belongs to him is the number of jerseys he owns. I, it's still unbelievable to me how he owns almost 300 uh, St. Cloud state themed jerseys or player themed jerseys in some way, shape That's or form. Insane. It's blows my mind to be honest with you we should uh, i'm just telling you if we ever get a huskies warming house podcast jersey i think we know who the first one to uh get it is i I, think i think we know exactly who's gonna get that (laughs) (laughs) definitely so rachel had 52 block shots in her senior season and was a top three finisher in block shots all four years in a huskies uniform uh so congratulations to our winner uh which like we mentioned was tinner heath taking sole possession of second place on the leaderboard. Nick, that's all I've got for uh, housekeeping notes. So let's jump right into Center Ice View News and Notes. Center Ice View News and Notes. Center Ice View provides you with the best coverage of St. Cloud State Huskies hockey from game notes, recaps, photos, and more. Go to centericeview.com. Center Ice View News and Notes, plenty of non-college and college-related news here in this week's episode. First one is going to be related more to the Minnesota Wild and some NHL signings and also just some general NHL news. Uh, Small tidbits. Uh, First of all, the Minnesota Wild signing, uh, again, Andrew Hammond, or better known as the Hamburglar. (laughs) Again, he was with the Iowa Wild between 2018 and 19 season. Uh, And this is more due to a Alex Stalock upper body injury, as was reported by the Minnesota Wild. And the big part here, Noah, is that it's an indefinite upper body injury. Again, they have not been specific. They have not mentioned that it would require any sort of surgery or whatnot, but they did mention the term indefinite, which has prompted the signing of, again, Andrew Hammond. Yeah, it's interesting to think about too. Uh, you generally don't sign goaltenders unless you have to. I mean, that's just, you don't give out, people maybe have this misconception, even with the AHL, you don't give out contracts like candy. There's a reason there's 50 people max that you can have in your organization at any point in time for contracts. I mean, you don't just hand out money. So uh, interesting, Alex Stalock uh, finished last season with a 9-10 save percentage. Uh, Andrew Hammond uh, last played in an NHL game in the spring of 2018 with Colorado. He owns a 9-2-3 save percentage across 56 NHL starts. Uh, and like you mentioned, spent some time in Iowa with Capo Kakinen as well. Uh, pretty good mentor for him. So uh, um, pretty interesting signing for the wild. I think their goaltending tandem is still more solid than it was last year. So looking forward to seeing how that rotation shakes out. Uh, the only other notable signing, Nick, uh, the Florida Panthers inked Anthony Duclair to a one year, $1.7 million deal, 23 goals, 17 assists in 66 games last season with Ottawa. As we've seen though, with Ottawa, not resigning him and the trade from the Columbus blue jackets, uh, there might be some, I don't want to say off ice issues, but more just kind of temperament and demeanor 
yeah, professionalism issues, if you will, with Anthony Duclair that are kind of under the radar a little bit, I guess is probably the best way to put that. Could be. Um, and again, it's just inconsistency of just staying on the ice topic. You know, I think that, you know, Duclair, uh, when he was, you know, with uh, Team Canada, World Juniors, I mean, just a, a very important, high profile mm-hmm. player. But uh, when he's gotten into the NHL, I mean, we've had, you know, flashes in the pan, per se, of what he can do, but never has really been able to string it all together consistently. So that's the big, you could call knock on him. He actually re- had a nice bounce back here, as we mentioned here with the stats there, Noah. Uh, and so, again, as, as I predicted that, he would have to probably sign something short term and for quite a bit less money. And that's indeed what happened. So Florida, again, a team that's looking to kind of rebound their franchise. You could say signing, you know, Sergei Bobrovsky last year and plenty of others. So some free agents last year, now adding Anthony Duclair to basically a show me contract, uh, you know, a pretty good, I'd say low risk signing there for the Florida Panthers. If indeed he's able to recreate some of the numbers he did last year in Ottawa. They've also talked about uh, with the departure currently of Mike Hoffman that he'll actually probably fill a top six role and, like you said, kind of see what he's got in an elevated role there uh, with an organization that could desperately use some offense replacing Mike Hoffman, who his 29 goals lead all remaining UFAs to this current point in time. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the World Juniors and Junior Hockey in general too, Nick. Uh, the Western Hockey League pushed back their targeted January 8th start date due to public health restrictions across Western Canada and the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Uh, and the World Juniors, the United States did finalize their World Junior Championship roster. Uh, Leafs' Nick Robertson uh, was uh, a notable omission because of the NHL's predicted start date, like we mentioned with Alexi Lafreniere. That was a, um, a question mark as far as the Canadian roster was concerned. The U.S. plays its first official game December 25th versus Russia at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time in uh, Edmonton. And interestingly enough, Nick, they're playing Russia, but... I don't know if this will pertain to uh, the Russian team here. The Court of Arbitration for Sport on uh, today banned Russia from using its name, flag, and anthem at the next two Olympics and any world championship events for the next two years. So don't know if they're actually going to be called Russia when they're uh, up in Edmonton or how that's going to shake out. But uh, um, yeah. Um, Also, Nick. Speaking of Edmonton, since we're in Edmonton, uh, two people have been arrested after a three-month investigation in connection with stealing $500,000 worth of Wayne Gretzky memorabilia from Walter Gretzky's home. That's Wayne Gretzky's father. Multiple game-used sticks, hockey gloves, pants, jerseys, and a Player of the Year award were recovered and returned. Uh, Nick, I mean, I love the great one just as much as anybody. I mean, I don't get it. Like, why? Why? I do. I do. I mean, they're, it, they're, they're very high sought after items. And sure. unfortunately, you know, when you have, you know, a hockey crazy city like Edmonton, who, you know, has, you know, a supposed the next great one and Connor McDavid on their roster. Um, again, Wayne Gretzky, you know, when you grew up in the area of Washington, he just was a, a men amongst boys. I mean, just, he was a, a, a pretty much an emerging sort of why the game is the, the way it is right now, just the speed, the skill, the creativity, um, and unfortunately, for some people, they want something that they can't have. So they resort to all their options in order to get it. So I'm glad that it's, you know, somewhat resolved and everything, you know, I don't know if everything was recovered. It sounds like a lot of things were recovered, but, you know, sad to say that you have to break into the great one's dad's house in order to try to get your hands on something uh, for personal gain. So that bothers me quite a bit. From what I understand, I think pretty much everything was returned. So uh, that's always good to hear. Uh, Speaking of Canada staying up around the Quebec area, uh, longtime president and general manager of the Quebec Nordiques and Colorado Avalanche, uh, I believe it's Pierre Lacroix, if I am mispronouncing that, let me know. Uh, He died Sunday at the age of 72, a two-time Stanley Cup champion in 1996 and 2001 with the Colorado Avalanche and the rival of Colorado in today's world and back then. The Chicago Blackhawks have named incumbent general manager manager Stan Bowman, the club's new president of hockey operations on Wednesday, and he will occupy this role as well as GM and pretty much oversee the the quote unquote rebuild for the Chicago Blackhawks. I've seen a lot of Hawks fans that are kind of up in arms about this one, Nick, uh, with Stan Bowman. Obviously, he did lead him to three cups, but I don't know if he's particularly in tune to the rebuild or if I I don't know if the players are just in tune with him and the way he's handled it uh, since winning those three cups. But uh, Nick, do do you think it's uh, kind of interesting that he's occupying both of those roles when some people in Chicago say that Rocky Wirtz and company can't even have him manage one role appropriately anymore? 
Well, first of all, I don't know how you can say that he hasn't managed one role correctly when he's won three Stanley Cups in the last 10 years. And in fact, it was three Stanley Cups in six years. If they go back to 2010, 13 and 15. Uh, and let's talk about 2010, right? This team was over the cap by what's five or six million dollars. They had to dump a whole bunch of talent. They came back and won the cup three years later. So he's done many rebuilds, but obviously now some of those core players, Jonathan Tate, Patrick Kane, they are aging. So this is a different uh, possibility. Um, it's scary. Minnesota sports fans know this. Again, you talk about the, the timber wolves. I'm, I'm actually <laughs> having a basketball reference here now, which is uh, strange for me, but it's the same kind of mentality where if you give someone maybe a little bit too much power that, you know, does it really, you know, reap the benefit of it? We won't know. Um, I understand that the Hawks uh, fan base is concerned because again, there's clearly, you know, uh, some, some things on the ice that are not as the same as they were five years ago when they last won the cup. Uh, again, Kane and Taves are in their thirties. Um, you have some good young players and Dylan Strom and Alex to coming in. Uh, but again, there, there still needs to be more because eventually someone, has to fill those roles, right? At some point, Kane and Tate are going to start to decline where, you know, they're going to be like a Zach Preeze and Ryan Suter for the Minnesota Wild. So do they want Stan Bowman to be leading that charge? They say he can because he's done it already a couple of times midway through. He's won them again, three Stanley Cups in 10 years. So we'll just have to wait and see how he handles the dual role. I liked how you mentioned uh, things are not the same as they were five years ago. And that's uh, very true for another player staying in the central division. Alex Steen of the St. Louis blues at age 36 announced his retirement today after 15 season. He has one more year left on his contract at 5.75 million, but he has already been placed on long-term injured reserve because he was injured during the NHL's buyout period, meaning that the team can exceed the salary cap to pay him uh, that change. Uh, his decision uh, at talking about things not being the same as they were, in the past uh his retirement is linked to multiple levels of degenerative herniated discs of his lumbar spine and that's something that we've uh seen has been well documented with alex steen and it's tough because he was one heck of a hockey player still was one heck of a hockey player even with his ailing back injuries uh the blues acquired steen from the toronto maple leafs during the 2008-9 season uh, he was the 24th overall pick of the leafs in the 2002 nhl draft playing just over a thousand games with 622 points to his credit and of course, won a Stanley Cup with St. Louis in 2019 and a silver medal with Sweden in 2014 in the Sochi Olympics. Uh, and Nick, let's just stick right with the train again. The Swedes now moving to Henrik Lundqvist of the Washington Capitals. And when I say of the Washington Capitals, very short lived, unfortunately. Uh, Lundqvist, the king, will not play this season due to a heart condition, the veteran goals under announced today. Uh, he says doctors determine it's best. He doesn't play during the upcoming campaign following weeks and weeks of tests that he underwent. He had just signed a $1.5 million deal for this season. I'm 38 years old, so you don't really particularly know if he's going to be back in an NHL sweater in general uh, if he does, in fact, sort things out even beyond this season. Um, and the only other news staying out east in that conference area and a bit of happier news, unfortunately, um, contrasting Lundqvist's heart, heart condition is Philadelphia Flyers forward Oscar Lindblom is cancer free just over one year after being diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. His girlfriend mentioned, quote, 369 days ago, we found out that Oscar had cancer. And today we got to know that his scans are clear after his second checkup, end quote. So, uh, Nick, let's go back a little bit to uh, Henrik Lundqvist. Um, do you believe, and I know this is a very, very early news and prediction, do you believe that if Henrik Lundqvist can at least work out and stay in shape and stay into some sort of athletic form that he's been accustomed to, even with his declining skill set um, and his increasing age that we've seen has kind of plagued him and his departure for, from New York, uh, do you think Henrik Lundqvist has one more season of NHL eligibility in him should he come back after this season? It depends, honestly. Um, I'm not a doctor, but uh, I'm closely affiliated with one. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> um, it, it really depends, honestly. You know, they don't mention specifically, again, I, I think we should preface it that this was Henrik Lundqvist that was announcing this, again, on social media, uh, very eloquently written, again, by uh, King Henrik. Again, you can see that he wants to play so bad. Um, and for me, for him to come out and to opt out of a season, essentially, because of the health condition, uh, there's got to be something, you know, understandably pretty serious about it. 
So a couple of questions I have from a, I guess, a, a, a human body perspective, is it a, a rhythmic or an electrical issue with the heart or is it more muscular? Is there something with a valve? Uh, we just don't know, right? So to me, the heart, anything the heart's involved, it's tough because again, you know, if you don't treat it the right way, if it's something where it's uh, not necessarily an acute or a, a small thing, is it, if it's a chronic condition, and again, we don't know what it is, um, that's tough. Um, and unfortunately for Henrik, again, like you said, he's 38 years old. Um, you know, he's got life after playing hockey. I do feel like he has absolutely a future as an executive role in hockey at some point, um, whether it's coaching, uh, whether it's, you know, managing, I do think he will be in the game of hockey, but I'm going to make a bold prediction. I think Henrik Lundqvist's playing days are over. All right. I, I, I guess I don't disagree with you based on the trend that we've seen. I hope you're wrong though. And I think I do too. Agree. Honestly, and, I yep. hope I'm wrong. Yeah. And I, like I said, I think you would agree with me on that one. Uh, sticking with goaltending trends now and a goaltender that we're going to have on later in the show is eagerly anticipating with the rest of her team, some St. Cloud state hockey news, St. Cloud state women's hockey team schedule has been tentatively announced uh, starting uh, tentatively January 9th and 10th with a home and home against the Minnesota golden Gophers, uh, a couple of homestands, with Bemidji and Wisconsin before traveling to the University of Minnesota Duluth to finish the month of January. Uh, a home stand against Mankato and then a bye week following that in early February. And then a couple of road trips, first to Ohio State and then to Bemidji State again to finish out the season uh, on February 26th and 27th as of now. Uh, times haven't really been confirmed and we don't know if those dates are firmly set in stone. But uh, Nick, it's not the only bit of uh, women's hockey news that you would have to share with us. No, Emma Gentry being the uh, name, the WCHA Rookie of the Week. Again, uh, got that game-winning goal first uh, game uh, again the last weekend. Uh, very beautiful five-hole goal. I mean, just an incredible play there. I believe it wasn't that Clara Himmelrova with the setup there in the 2-1-1, or was I, that? I'm uh, trying to think. You mentioned was it last Nina week. Newland? I think you Nina Newland. Maybe they were both involved. I wouldn't be shocked if they were both involved. I thought I saw you in Newland's either. game. Apologies that we that we don't know that. We probably should know that. <laughs> we, should, that we should know isn't that. Isn't that something we probably it should know? It is something. But uh, – <laughs> Beautifully executed two on one there in overtime. And again, Emma Gentry, I mean, you have to have confidence uh, to, to shoot for the wickets on a goaltender. Uh, it just beautifully placed again. Sometimes it's not how hard you shoot. It's where you shoot it. And Emma Gentry found the wickets and uh, she's coming uh, as, as advertised, you could say again, with the uh, coming in, having that offensive skill set that was so highly touted and she's showing it and hoping that this is just, you know, a breaking the glass and there's more to come from her. So congratulations again to Emma Gentry, the WCHA rookie of the week. Majentry uh, coming recently from Honey Bake 19U. Uh, she's been playing really, really well. Uh, Taylor Lynn, too, uh, has been playing well. And we mentioned that last week, but I mentioned it because I'm thinking of her goal before Emma Gentry's goal, where both of those came from the slot, which means the St. Cloud State women's hockey team uh, wasn't really around the house as much uh, in hockey games trying to score offensively. So I think they're doing a much better job getting to those centrally located areas and high danger scoring chance opportunities. Uh, really excited, hopefully, to see them back in action. I think they have a lot to prove in the WCHA. And don't forget, this is the last year uh, before St. Thomas joins us in 2021 for next season as well, we'll, we'll where we will have eight teams in the WCHA. Uh, moving on to a league that already has eight teams, Nick, our men's hockey group in the NCHC pod, like we had mentioned previously before showtime or at showtime i should say on thursday today wow that was an abhorrent transition but we're going to try to move our way out of that one neck <laughs> um, two games left for the huskies after tonight is what i'm trying to say men's hockey four and three at showtime with 13 nchc points they did earn a point uh in last night's loss against north dakota i believe that's because they went straight to three on three overtime which we're going to touch on that a little bit more in depth after after our interview um but we said last week when they were getting ready to play north dakota omaha north dakota again and then of course colorado college tomorrow we had said that the huskies needed to be 500 in the next four games to put themselves in a good position, entering the final game on Sunday, they are one and two in the first three games. So this matchup against Colorado college, which will be done by the time this show airs is going to be very, very important. I would say right now, their goal differential is plus two compare that with a couple of other teams that are up in that higher bracket, plus 10 plus 11 plus nine. Uh, so the Huskies just eking games out. They're pretty much almost even in terms of uh, goals for and goals against 3.1 goals for 2.9 goals against. So, I mean, that's, this is a team that's about as 
almost 500 as you can uh, particularly get two for 20 on the power play. That's 10%, not looking so hot, but 26 for 29 on the kill, which is 89.7%. So they are keeping the puck out of their net for the amount of penalties that they have taken. That's 11 minutes per game of penalties they've taken compared to eight minutes per game for their opponents. Um, plus 15 in shots on goal. A lot of stats I'm throwing at you here, but plus 15 in shots on goal. And I only mention that because uh, when you look at a box score, and this is not indicative of you know how the game went per se. I mean, you think about that two to nothing loss versus Omaha. Huskies did everything but score 41 shots on goal, and probably weren't the better team in that game. But I think you know you go back to the game against North Dakota last night. Uh, n- St. Cloud was the better hockey team for the majority of that game. And I think that shots on goal reference shows me that the Huskies are getting opportunities or at least creating some sort of chances more than we're kind of giving them credit for. But again, what, what has been the theme for this St. Cloud state group going back to last year, 2018, 2017 execution, execution at the right times. Uh, One guy that has executed Nick, before I kick it over to you, Nick Perbix leading the team with six points, three goals, three assists. Uh, Brodzinski, Fitzgerald, Cranola, and Mietnin round out the top five with five points and Henches, Zach Okabe, who has one less game play than the rest in this group and Nolan Walker all have four points. Glad to see Nolan Walker contributing here. David Rennick an eight, nine, seven, save percent across five starts and Joey Lamru and Jackson Caster have a 905 and 889 respectively and I think have done their part uh, when they've come in for the games that they uh, participated in Nick I don't I don't really know like what to kind of think about this men's hockey team in terms of I, I mean they've had a rough patch this week I mean there's no other particular way to say it they haven't gotten the results they're looking for I think that uh, especially in the first week of the pod there were some times especially maybe against uh, like Western Michigan in that first game where mistakes uh, didn't come back to bite the Huskies uh, you take an overtime goal a loss against North Dakota a big mistake by the Huskies that was uh evidently opened up within the first eight seconds. I mean, what have you liked from the Huskies? What do you want to see more of? Um, Should we expect uh, the last two games of the pod to be not so fruitful for the Huskies, or do you think they'll find a way to get back on track here? Well, they need to get back on track, right? Um, At the end of it, this is, you know, the only part of their season that has gone, at least for as far as COVID-related concerns, that (laughs) has gone flawlessly. And I I hate to mention it that way, but again, yeah, there's a vaccine out now, but it's probably going to be a while before it trickles into the, you know, I guess the masses, if you want to call it. So there's still a lot of question marks surrounding what the schedule might look like as we get out of the pod. And I think, with that being said, we have to really credit the NCHC conference as a whole. Again, the teams involved, uh, it has gone essentially flawlessly. Um, so it's really good to know that, you know, we can look forward to a, a couple of these remaining games and to know that it's going to happen, right? It's been great. A couple of things I've liked about the Huskies. I like the fact that for the most part, five on five, they've been a really good team. I think they've been using their strength, which has been speed. I think they've been creating some good opportunities. A couple of things that I don't like, team defense has not been great. Um, I I think if, if you were to look at the Huskies as a whole, too many mistakes, especially crucial areas of the ice. I'm talking the blue lines. I'm talking in the middle. And it's giving opportunities for teams to transition and go back on them with numbers and and just not good, solid structure defensively for them. And if anything, maybe defending too much, right? And then the only grab I have about that offensively, you talk about execution, the first game against North Dakota, I loved where VT Bietnan was out wide and intentionally shot a puck towards that far pad to kick it out right to Cranola, who all I did was buried in a wide open net. It's sometimes not shooting to score, but shooting to create commotion. It, you saw that in last night's game where the Huskies second period and on, they were really just either trying to wrap around the puck. They were really trying to get up to the crease and they need more of that. They need more second and third chance opportunities. There's too many one and dones on offense for this, uh, for this team. So they're going to see some adjustments, Again, power play, uh, we've touched on it quite a bit over these last uh, couple of you weeks. Know, uh, you know, I, I kind of wanted to actually jump in on there too. And I'm glad also you mentioned about uh, it's good that we do have hockey back. One thing to note for both the men's and women's squads, as far as we've understood from players and coaches, is that uh, NCAA eligibility does not count for the season. So if uh, players can find a way to continue classes for next year, they can actually uh, be super seniors again or freshmen again, if you will, in terms of their NCAA eligibility. But I want to talk about that 
power play. I know we've hammered on it quite a bit, but it, it was a discussion that was brought up by a couple of our um, couple of our fans, and really the, the discussion was started by um, at Brody Falconer, and he had kind of mentioned about you know what is the adjustment that's appropriate for. Um, this power play here. I mean, what are they, what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Why haven't they found production? And from what I've noticed from this power play group is that they predominantly set up in an overload and it's a pretty deep overload because they have that guy setting up down low um, behind the goal line, which is obviously you're not a scoring threat, but you're looking for either a pass out to the slot or a backdoor play. It just gives you an opportunity to kind of force the play through one side of the net there. And we kind of talked about how you have a couple shooters like VG Mietin and Easton Brodzinski, but the power play has been too stagnant and there's not enough movement so that, you know, the pucks go into one of those shooters. Do you think, and it seemed like there was a lot of opportunities too, where guys were on their on hand or off hand when they should or shouldn't have been to, do you think it's necessarily a systems adjustment that has to happen, a personnel adjustment that has to happen, you know, where you can run an overload, but you need to switch out the hands or the particular players that are there. Or do you think it's a little bit of both where they should tinker with a new system and a new set of uh, looks as far as on hands and off hands are concerned? Because for those who um, don't particularly know about special teams on hands and off hands can make a world of difference as far as um, special teams opportunities, such as one timers, AKA, you know, Alex Ovechkin esque type plays. To me, it's more systematic than anything. I, I think, you know, they've been working the off hands. Again, yetnan has been on the right side. You've had Spencer Meyer, Easton Brodzinski on their off sides. Again, right-handed shots on the left-hand side. Uh, to me, the big comparison, and we got to see it twice, North Dakota's power play, the movement that they do from low to high, and it's the players without the puck for me, for St. Cloud, it's got to be the biggest improvement. There's just two, there's just not enough movement, right? I mean, if you talk about a penalty killer. If you, all you have to do is know that a guy is standing there, such as a Mietin, and if the puck is on the weak side of him, then you don't have to really worry about it. So it becomes more of a four on four situation. But if they're doing what North Dakota actually was like, almost like a high to low cycle uh, where players are changing out, defensemen end up walking through. You got Jordan Kawaguchi who comes in from the top and he's just collapsing down. That movement is forcing you to almost become puck watching and that's what opens up some of those seam passes opens up some of those backdoor uh, when you get to the top of the umbrella to do one timers so it allows some of those shot lines to open up and allows again the penalties to be distracted so to me it's movement with the players of the without the puck to me it's more systematic for the power play for the huskies than it is personnel wise last topic for you too and uh, i like how you mentioned too about the power play you kind of saw a north dakota defenseman too you could see when they ran down in that deep overload and went past the puck below the goal line you just saw a north dakota defenseman he would just lay down in the crease because he knew like that was the play that the huskies were trying to do so you'd have to sauce it over him and then the other defenseman would probably try to bat it out of the air or cover that weak side i mean when a power play looks pretty predictable something has to change for me i think it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world too for uh, maybe to just put a guy like nick perverts or easton brodzinski up top and run a one two two with a double screen and just kind of start peppering pucks at the net i mean it, you know wolves have to see what brett larson and his company adjust with the last topic i want to touch on and i know we've touched on it probably about two or three weeks ago um david rennick and not not to the extent that we touched on it you know, previously, but I know there's also been some concern too about uh, David and his starts uh, for specifically. He tends to give up a goal um, probably more often in the first five minutes or sometimes even the first shot of the game. I, I guess from my perspective, I'm kind of like, doesn't matter when and where those pucks go across the goal line, as long as less pucks go across our goal line than the other goal line, doesn't matter what time of the game it is. Um, does David Rennick's play, um, especially early on in the game, does it worry you or do you feel like he's giving the team a chance to win? At the end of it, you know, like you said, you hit it exactly. It doesn't matter when or where. Again, it could be a 0-0 hockey game and we could not have a single score. And then North Dakota scores with 10 seconds left in the hockey game. And are we just now having a conversation that is, is he can finish a game? I mean, honestly, I mean, at what, what point do the goalposts matter? It's a puck that gets behind you. So, uh, you, again, it's not about just the goaltender of why the puck goes in the back of your net. Was there a turnover? Was there a defensive breakdown? What led up to having this opportunity? for the team to get the puck into a, either a good shooting position or was it really where David Rennick, was he off of his angle? Uh, did he not read a pass correctly? Was he slow? Was his glove down? Those are some things you can absolutely break down on film, but nine times out of 10, it's a systematic breakdown first before David Rennick is in a situation where he's either guessing, he's outnumbered, and it's just not a situation where he is going to you know, be the beneficiary of it trying to make a, a save. 
I remember watching uh, the North Dakota game last night uh, where the, the opening goal was a five hole shot coming through on kind of a mini breakaway of sorts. And he had talked about as a goaltender. He said, that was a nice play. And I was kind of like, yeah, I mean, it was all right, but he's like, no, seriously. Cause if he drops his shoulder there and then takes one step to the backhand, he's froze David Rennick. And he, and he thinks, Oh, Rennick was probably cheating, anticipating that play, which most guys do when they have some sort of separation is try to freeze a goaltender. So it was just a nice little shot. Was it there a little bit of luck involved potentially, but nonetheless, uh, I think David, David Rennick has been solid as well. Uh, we will touch on um, some overtime woes for the Huskies last night as well and what that means and what three-on-three -three hockey means, but we will touch on that in our after interview segment here. So stay tuned for that one. But our interview involves a goaltender and a defenseman as well. Hannah Bates and Emma Pluzny, both currently seniors. Uh, as of now, they've talked about potentially maybe coming back for another season if they get the opportunity. But of course, Emma Pluzny putting up some pretty world-class numbers last year in net. And Hannah Bates, uh, a defensive defenseman of uh, block shot blocking variety, probably pretty much replaces Rachel Herzog as someone who's able to clear clear the crease in front of Pluzny when she can. They were both really, really fun to talk to. Or kind of a lengthier interview around 45 or 50 minutes or so. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, Nick, uh, what did you like for the interview and what can we expect? I like the personality differences uh, and I'll, I'll, I won't go uh, further than that, that uh, you're going to see two different people uh, who play two different positions. And uh, it's kind of fun to see uh, how they approach uh, the game as well as how they approach uh, off the ice. So it was a fun interview. Yeah, very interesting, too, that they're also roommates as well. So it's interesting to see the dynamic between them. But we won't keep you waiting any longer. Hannah Bates and Emma Paluzny. With a new guest joining every week, it's a lineup chock full of players, coaches, fans, and more. This week's special guest is The Healthy Scratch. And welcome to this week's Healthy Scratch interview segment, where we are welcoming two current Huskies women's hockey, hockey team members. It is goaltender Emma Paluzmi and Hannah Bates. Ladies, thanks again for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, so shine of the gun there, Noah. Me? Well, I was just, I was making sure that you were ready to go. I, I have a question for both of you ladies. I, I mean, Emma, maybe we'll start with you. I know that your roommate situation with yourself, Hannah, McKenna Weslow, and Laura Kluge is a very tight-knit situation. But I got to ask, how much are you really going to miss Laura Kluge scraping every bit of the oats out of her bowl every morning <laughs> over this break? Or, or, or is it a welcome relief uh, to have maybe a week or two away from the roomies? Yeah, well, I'm still up in St. Cloud right now during finals week, kind of just working out and, and doing a couple of things around here. So I still get to experience the oatmeal scraping a little bit here and there. Uh, but it's definitely something that, you know, I think I, I might find I miss it after after she does kind of um, leave the nest and, and, you know, me and Han might be here by ourselves and there won't be any oatmeal scraping going on. But I know that, um, you know, Kenna and Han, they still have their little habits too that, that you know, I, it's just stuff that, you know, you just, you, you find that you maybe will miss once they're, uh, they're gone. <laughs> and uh, I guess on your side too, I mean, is there, are there certain like roommate quirks? I always feel like no matter how great of a friend you have as a roommate, there's definitely four or five things that just absolutely drive you up a wall. Is there anything maybe like Poe does specifically that just drive you absolutely nuts? Oh, there is, um, from the first, from the first day we met, there was, <laughs> This is just a funny story. So first day we meet, you know, we go to Garvey and and she's this is freshman like enjoying year. her All meal. The way back. Yeah, freshman year. Yep. Go to Garvey and she's just like really enjoying her food and likes to express it. And it's also a loud chewer. And nothing drives me more insane than listening to people chew. So um, you know, for the last three and a half three and a half years I've had the pleasure of listening to loud chewing but we kind of have like an understanding now so she's like sitting in the kitchen I'm like doing some homework I just give a little glance and she knows she knows now so <laughs> we've really grown in our relationship and you know if we do if um we get another year I have one more year of listening to Pope enjoy her food. So <laughs> I will also miss the, um, scraping of the bowl. That is another pet peeve as well. 
Um, yeah, I think that we definitely all have our things. I don't know what mine is. I, Poe, do you have any? Like, I feel like you don't have that many. I feel like you're a really yeah. good roommate. Like we've been roommates <gasps> since freshman year, oh. and I feel like I'm not sick of you yet. So you're pretty, <laughs> pretty good. I know kind of drives me crazy when she leaves her dishes in the sink, but she's like, she's gotten better. <laughs> yeah, that we're is make, another one. We're making the protein shakes at six o'clock in the morning. Although those cinnamon donut protein shakes are absolutely amazing. Uh, Emma, I guess speaking about food, we're going to jump right into the foodie stuff, I guess. <clears throat> I, I believe there is a particular show called the Husky Women Show about cooking mm -hmm. um thanksgiving i believe you cooked a whole turkey this this thanksgiving as well uh you're like a major foodie um i myself personally enjoy cooking with an instapot and make a lot of those sorts of things i mean what are you what are your go-to dishes i mean what what's on the menu at the house de Paluzny, if you will yeah i don't know i mean so we we started the cooking show sometime last year me and jenna jenna Haig were really into it last year and, and we actually the very first episode was on laura laura kluga's was on her Instagram story. And then the next time we wanted to do, we were like, let's start an Instagram page. So then we started a whole Instagram page for it. And we've been doing it for like, probably at least a year now, I would say. Um, I don't know, for go-tos, I would, we've been doing a lot of chili lately around the, the apartment on Sundays, chilies and soups made a really good like lentil curry soup a couple weeks ago. That was really good. But yeah, I don't know. I don't really have like a go to. I like to kind of try a little bit of everything. But the turkey was definitely that was a big one. That was it was, uh, you know, a handful. It was my first ever turkey that I had to do, too. So I was pretty nervous going into it. But uh, yeah, it turned out pretty good, I think. <laughs> I, re I really like the the analysis. It almost sounds like a hockey answer right there. Yeah, I felt pretty good going into it, but you know, once <laughs> once we got rolling, you know, start started getting it going, we just established that four check, and next thing you know, bam, turkey. Uh, exactly. <laughs> on the other side of that, Hannah, number one, how good is Emma's cooking really? And number two, uh, ha how much have you missed your dog Joe during this time? Uh, I know that's kind of maybe your go to crutch as far as uh, staying sane a little bit uh, um, in your free time. Yeah, so, um, you know, I have to say, Poe's food does get a lot of hype, but it, I would say it lives up to it. Like, it's pretty right. good stuff. Um, she shares, so that's pretty <laughs> awesome. I got some free chili, like, two weeks ago. Um, one comment on, on the turkey, Jenny. Um, this 22-pounder did take up our entire fridge for three days, so... <laughs> It was a little bit of um, a nuisance, but we we got it worked out, and she tasted great after being in the hour or er, being in the oven for six hours. So it was good. Yeah, it lived up to the hype. Um, for Joe, so you know, my sister actually um, got me a little gift because I didn't get to see Joe for quite some time. So I got a little stuffed animal. And his name is JJ for Joe Jr. So I miss Joe, but I got like a little cute stuffed animal that looks actually a lot like him. So it takes me through. <laughs> now, I got to ask, just because you cook a turkey for the first time, I mean, it, it, it's such a process. But my favorite food on Thanksgiving, I'm a foodie myself, is the dressing. And uh, I guess we use my grandmother's recipe from, oh, geez, probably no off I'm counting my age, like 1651 or something <laughs> like that. Uh, so was it just the turkey that you guys made or what else was part of the Thanksgiving festivities? Yeah, well, we, we did like a whole kind of team potluck Thanksgiving because obviously with COVID going on this year, nobody was really allowed to go home. And, and we played that weekend, too. We had our first series against Mankato the day after. So we all... Uh, we're, we're in St. Cloud for Thanksgiving and kind of just made an event of it. And uh, I think it was uh, the house. They brought the, the stuffing. It was uh, Yanina. I think it was Yanina's recipe, maybe. Um, but yeah, they, they made some pretty good stuffing, too. But we had, I think, probably two full tables just full of food. We had everything. We had like three different types of potatoes, I want to say, <laughs> and everything in between. So it was like awesome. And it, everything turned out so good. The only thing. And it was literally perfect up until like Turkey was probably three or four day extravaganza getting it ready. 
in the oven, had to go to practice while the turkey was still in the oven. So I was afraid I was going to come back and like the apartment was going to be burnt down. But uh, I get back, everything's fine. Turkey's done, you know, a little early. So take it out, making the gravy. Gravy, I'm like, oh no, gravy's not going to turn out so well. And, um, you know, eventually I get it to kind of like gravy texture and it's pretty thick and good and homemade gravy. Biggs brings the turkey, puts it on the, or she brings the gravy, puts it on the table. I got the big, huge container full of turkey at the last spot on the table. I put, I put it on the table, spill the gravy everywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> the whole oh. thing of gravy, a whole thing of gravy, basically. <laughs> I think there's probably just like a couple drops left for the first people that got their food. But I was like, you're kidding. Everything was perfect. But luckily, uh, we had a, a container of um, the, the the greatest gravy on earth, Heinz pre-made gravy from the can so <laughs> that came in clutch you know i'm really happy we we kind of thought about that sort of thing beforehand so it turned out good but it was a really probably probably one of the best thanksgivings you know i've had for sure being with the team the whole time it was it was pretty pretty cool experience so emma you, you, being that you're kind of the uh, the amateur executive chef here uh, i would imagine that you're kind of critical to the food you eat is there anybody else on the team that you know kind of competes with you as far as cooking skill or maybe recipes mm. are concerned i don't know i know um i know emma gentry likes to cook we were actually thinking about doing a a chopped episode the two of us <laughs> on the on the cooking show sometime we haven't gotten there yet you know with season getting started it's stuff's gotten busy but you know maybe here over winter break we'll do something you know a little cooking competition we, we joked and Allie and Niners wanted to be the the hosts and go grocery shopping for it and stuff like that get the surprised ingredients all that stuff so but I, I know she likes to cook but I think my roommates you know they all like to cook too I think you know over the years they I think I don't know if I've encouraged them but they've definitely started to cook more too but all of us really like to cook I feel like in the apartment for for the most part and, you know, if you ever need a taste tester, you know, I'm just right down the street. So please, <laughs> for you know, sure, for sure. Hands up. So uh, Miss Hannah Bates, have you uh, also been able to try some of the the other ladies cooking at all? And is there a, maybe a favorite dish that uh, Emma has made in the past that maybe you said, whoa, like, bro, why isn't Gordon Ramsay trying this? Like, you know. Um, all I can think of was like at Thanksgiving, um, the apartment across the hall with um, Clara and and Carl and all them, they made some candied yams. So Ooh. that was pretty awesome. But that's just like one dish that just comes off the top of my mind because it was unreal. Um, but I don't really think that anyone else is at Poe's level, to be honest. It's that's pretty, bad. pretty high. So <laughs> That's that's yeah. definitely that's definitely roommate love. Uh, yeah, it is. Hannah, um, let's turn into some thing that we're kind of here to talk about, uh, which is hockey. I hear that's important uh, in both <laughs> in both of your lives. I, uh, you know, a 19 U state champion, a 16 U state champion. You won three straight World Selects Invitational tournaments in 2012, 13, and 14. Uh, but let's go to 2014 and a viral video that involves you on the internet. I, I I had to play this one back today while I was at work in slow motion because it just absolutely blows my mind. Uh, the date is August 1st, 2014. The 16U Girls World Selects Invitational in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, a Russian player by the name of Svetlana, and her last name has way too many syllables, so I'm not going to go with that. Um, essentially, uh, slashed you over the head with her hockey stick. Um, you actually went on to uh, beat that team four to two in the semifinal and beat Sweden two to one in a shootout to win that tournament. Uh, but this is absolutely insane. I mean, if you ever get a chance to look at it on YouTube for people, the title is 16 U Russian hockey player breaks stick over Americans head, which is just insane. Uh, can you kind of take us through that moment in your playing career? Because I, I don't think that uh, people would necessarily know that unless they check it out on your player bio. Sure. So this was kind of like my 15 seconds of fame, but you know, it actually lasted a little bit longer. So every now and then, like it'll come up on Instagram on these random hockey pages and I'm like, wow, there it is again. I've resurfaced, but it's kind of funny because nobody knows who it is unless you know me pretty much. So it's pretty funny, but um, yeah. So what happened was I was just skating down, skating down, and then I shot the puck. And some of the comments are always like, oh, she must have stabbed the goalie or something. Um, and I'll get to the videoing part in a second. But, 
yeah, I, I just shot the puck and went down there and then, and then I turned it on and was skating away and she hit me in the side. So then that's like, I was down on one knee. So it kind of like shows that then I get up and then she went whoosh, over my head and I was just like in awe. And I tried to get up quickly. So I was like, mm, what if she's coming again? I'm not sure. So yeah, that was that. But pretty much um, the video was accidentally taken by Megro's grandma. So, yeah, so she had an iPad and was videoing the game. And then just for that, like, 10 seconds, like, happened to click on. And then I got hit. So that is how we got the video. It that's was wild. That's actually insane. It's it's interesting when you read some of the press releases, it's actually the second year in a row that I believe either that team or that particular player had had done this, which is, um, I, I mean, I don't know, Nick, I've been pretty mad at people playing hockey, but I can't think of a single time where I've legitimately <laughs> intended to injure somebody. Although I will say the most vicious people, if you're ever going to get a slash in the back as a forward, it's definitely probably coming from a goaltender, if you ask me. Uh, speaking of <laughs> speaking of goaltenders, Poe, uh, Mount Minnesota native yourself, um, interestingly enough, you finished the NCAA last year with 1,108 saves, which was a, a leader, number one in the NCAA, and a 911 save percentage, which is insane to me to think that that was through all of your years of high school, international play and college, that is your worst save percentage career-wise, which is amazingly impressive. So let me run through some stats here because uh, as Nick and our fans would know, I'm kind of a stats guy here. So saves total in your career up to this point, December 14th on Monday, 2,543 saves against 2,767 shots. And you have played just under 4,400 minutes in a St. Cloud State uniform. I, that means, if I'm not mistaken, that you face a shot every two minutes in a St. Cloud State sweater. Uh, is, is there a point, I know you set a career high with uh, 50 saves against Duluth last year. Is there a point when Nick and I have watched you, you know, from the press box, you don't ever seem to get frustrated. Like, I feel like some goaltenders at that point would just say, man, 35, 40, 45 saves a game. I'm just really frustrated. I mean, what allows you to stay so calm and collected and just kind of stay in there? Is it better for a goaltender to see that many shots and kind of stay fluid and moving? Or would you like the shot suppression to be, maybe have Hannah Bates block a couple more shots for you? <laughs> no, I, 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 I've always enjoyed it. Um, I mean, I, I would always rather be the goalie that's getting 30 shots plus a night than somebody that's only getting 15, 16, uh, like you see for some of the other teams in the league. I, I mean, the point of playing hockey is to be involved in the game. And that happens when you get shot on. Uh, it's definitely tiring. Sometimes last year was uh, definitely a pretty, a pretty tough one trying to, to take the brunt of the work with Janine being out for most of the season. Uh, you know, and it definitely was a little bit tough on the body. Uh, the 50 saves against Duluth. That one was a pretty tough one. I know my roommates probably were tired of hearing me cracking and creaking and moaning and groaning <laughs> and every time I had to get off the couch the next day. Um, but uh, it's, it's definitely something where, you know, I wouldn't really want to trade it for, you know, any other situation just because I, I think it's just, it's, it's meant to, meant to, to fit my, my game and, and what I like most about hockey. And that's just, you know, getting to actually play. Emma, most people would, you know, say you're crazy for trying to throw on some pads and to try to go in front of, you know, rubber coming at you 80, 90, sometimes a hundred miles an hour. Uh, what drove you to the goaltending position? You seem like you just have that personality that just wants to have, like you mentioned, being involved, have an impact. Uh, I guess, where did that spark to the position come from? Yeah, well, so I, I started playing hockey a little bit late, like when you're looking at um, Minnesota players, at least. Um, I mean, it was only, I think I was probably nine years old, maybe. So not that late, but definitely later than most of my friends. And I didn't know how to skate or do anything. So I was really, really bad. My first, um, my first, uh, year or two and my friends were all pretty good. And I knew that they were going to be making the A team moving forward. And I was like, Oh no, I'm, I'm probably not gonna get that call up. And I'm, the whole point of me playing hockey was to be with my friends. 
Uh, so I, I kind of thought, you know, why not be a goalie? They all sucked back then. So I'd blend in good there, you know, have a better <laughs> chance of uh, um, being able to, to keep playing with my friends, you know, and, and as we grew up, I, I did, I, I had this chance to play, you know, with the same group of girls for my whole youth career, high school career. I was from a small, smaller town, um, played high school hockey with them. And, you know, they're still some of the best friends I have from, from home now, uh, for sure. And it's definitely something I wouldn't want to trade up. In front of you, of course, you have a premier defenseman, a real stay-at-home defenseman, I think, is a really good way to put it. Hannah Bates in front of you, obviously, 107 games played to this point in her Husky career. Uh, first and only goal was December 7, 2019, against Bemidji State University. I have a question, Hannah. Do you remember who you earned your first point, essentially, assist against? Do you remember who the opponent was? October 27, 2017, do you, know, do you remember who your first point was against? Um, that's a good question. In October? In October. In October? Um, I am not sure about that one. That was a little while ago. You actually Can had... I guess? Sure, go ahead. Was it Ohio? Was, was it Ohio? I feel was, like we played was, Ohio that weekend. It was not Ohio. It was Mankato. Uh, a 4-2 to two win. You actually had two assists that night. So, um, not bad. Not bad. I, but you actually listed in your bio for your varsity softball letter winner at Trenton High School. Uh, would you consider yourself a good softball player? Do you watch a lot of baseball? Are you a big Detroit Tigers fan? Uh, I mean, what's the story on that? Sure. So, um, I played softball since I was seven or so um but I always liked hockey more I started with figure skating and then my dad bought some skates and pretty much some hockey skates and I pretty much stuck with it from there but um yeah so pretty much softball was always in the summer and hockey obviously fall and winter and spring and some summer so it just worked out to play both but I have to be honest, hockey was always number one. Uh, it was more exciting and just, there's just a lot more action. So <laughs> hockey was always my favorite. And uh, I don't think that that was my softball coach's favorite thing. But I mean, I didn't really say it out loud, but I think it's safe to say it now. I'm past my softball prime. So, so yeah, um, I enjoy the Tigers, but they're not always the best. So I enjoy going to the games and the experience, but yeah, like I said, hockey was always my favorite. So Red Wings, Red yeah. Wings are my favorite too. Red Wings. I mean, do you, I mean, do you watch the Red Wings much? Do you feel, do you feel within the next five years they can get back in their groove or what's the deal here? We can just pray for that to happen because <laughs> it's been a uh, tough the last few years. I actually haven't, watch too many just because like I'm always busy with school and everything but I know it hasn't been good that's what I do know Nick I, so I don't know I don't know if I, I don't know if I have any sympathy for someone who the last couple of years haven't been good but the previous 25 were really really good for that organization as a Minnesota Wild fan it's hard to have a whole lot of sympathy I don't know. <laughs> you know, not, not too many big names come out of that organization, especially the last 25 yeah. years, you know, not th nobody <laughs> important. Uh, but Hannah, I, I do want to follow up here, you know, with the hockey theme, uh, you know, you're coming us here on the show. You're, you're kind of lighthearted. I see, you know, I get this, you know, very bubbly sense personality for you, but I think, you know, for, for me itself as a hockey player, when you step on the ice, there's a switch, right? Does Hannah Bates have a switch and are you <laughs> like the just prime competitor when it comes out to you, and I actually want to ask you, and then I actually want to go back to uh, the goaltender that sits behind you. You know, what is Hannah Bates like on the ice? That's what I want to know. Um, I'd say, yeah, I'm pretty, obviously I'm pretty bubbly. Um, I like, yeah, I like to have a smile on my face and everything. Um, I would say there's a switch, like, you know, in the last or in the first few games here, uh, there's been a couple penalties that happened just because, you know, I don't like they just happen. my goalie. It really bugs me. It really bugs me. So um, that's kind of something that I don't tolerate well. So, you know, Poe and I were talking about this the other day. I was like, I just can't put my hands up. I just need to use like my elbow or something like don't tell the refs this, but yeah, I got to find a different <laughs> way or just, you know, take the number and then, and figure it out later. But um, 
yeah, I would say there's a little bit of a switch. I, I mean, I like to keep like lighthearted and, and, you know, like myself, but you know, when the game comes, I'm not going to take anyone's crap. So you have to put the switch on too. So. Uh, Paluzny, what, what's it like to have Hannah Bates in front of you trying to block some shots? And it also sounds like uh, take some nameplates uh, when someone's coming into your blue paint area. Yeah, I feel like this year, especially, I don't know, like, I'd be like, and she's gotten a couple penalties, like she said, and we were, we're we've been rooming the last two road weekends. So we were joking about it too. And, and, uh, you know, I told her, yeah, just stop finishing like the full push, you know, just kind of run into him a little bit and then maybe you won't get called so much, but she's definitely something, somebody that, you know, I, I rely on when I'm, when I'm playing, you know, I know she's looking out for me, taking taking care of me making sure that we're not getting any crap from anybody um but yeah it's definitely been fun I feel like just watching Han and myself and you know our whole class kind of grow over the course of the years we've as a group I think we've all played you know pretty solid minutes throughout our, our entire time here so far so it's been it's been really fun kind of just to see how our class has grown and uh kind of matured over time and and it's definitely it's exciting to see what we can uh, do this year and what we've got in store. Yeah, exciting start for the year. Uh, last year, I actually remember telling Hannah Bates that uh, I was going to be jumping on the ice with you guys as well. Nick was filming uh, as we got to go out there. And I told Hannah that I was going to beat her one on one and she didn't take too kindly to that. So I can definitely see where the competitive edge comes from. But I got to say. Emma Paluzny on the other side got the best of me in this one. Uh, Nick was there, uh, came in. I think I had some sort of mini breakaway, a little forehand, backhand, tried to go blocker side, wide open net. And all of a sudden, the right side <laughs> pinball flipper out of nowhere kicks the puck away. Uh, Emma, do you remember uh, that play at all? Because I think, I think I had probably nine or ten shots against you. I think I scored one, maybe one. Yeah, I don't remember. I remember when you were out on the ice with this last last year doing that stuff with Kenna. And I remember it was pretty fun because, uh, you know, we were a little bit shorthanded, I feel like, at the time. But I don't remember that. There was a lot of saves that happened that year, as you had said. So it's kind of <laughs> hard to remember individual ones. That's kind of just like the whole, like, every weekend, I never really remember what happens. Like, I'll remember it right away after we get off the ice. But then it's like, within a day or so it's like I can't remember anything that happened or or anything like I'll remember goals and stuff like that but definitely short-term memory for sure she, she just she makes so many saves right she just can't even remember how routine it was <laughs> I was just, just that was, uh, started forgetting stuff uh question is Noah do you think uh you know would Paluzny have stopped the tip play from last fall if yeah we, we got a stick on that we had a pretty we had a pretty good set play, Nick and I did in rec hockey off of a face off. That was a nice redirect in front. I uh, I mean I don't know I I, I feel like. I feel like it'd be interesting. Maybe, maybe before you exit uh, your senior season, whenever that officially is, uh, we'll have to do a shootout maybe with the Huskies Warming House podcast and really see how the showdown actually goes. I think that would be good too. And that then maybe would be a fun time. And then maybe we'll put maybe we'll put Nick in some pads and have Hannah Bates shoot on shoot on him. I think that would be cool too. I've actually put on goalie pads a couple of times. So here down in the cities, uh, Egan, they have a, a house set for, uh, you know, for, if you, for pickup hockey and, you know, if I'm bored, you know, normally I'll just skate or whatnot, but I'll throw the pads on and I'm not afraid of it, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not an Emma Paluzny. In fact, uh, I would say Swiss cheese could stop more pucks than I could, but uh, you know, at the end of it, it's it. Uh, I would love that challenge uh, to see if I could, uh, I don't know, maybe get at least one or two good saves. And I actually know it'd be really fun to have Paluzny come down to me. That would be fun. Yeah. I, you, know, <laughs> you know, but here's the thing, though. If Paluzny comes down, this is the kicker, Nick. She's got to be singing. How about this interesting fact? Emma Paluzny has sung karaoke on three different continents. Uh, oh, where did that kind of start? Are we talking like like full on 90 style karaoke with the bouncing ball and the TV screen? Or, you know, how does even one is there competitions for karaoke? How, how do you get involved in such a such a soiree? Yeah, I'm a big karaoke fan. Um, <laughs> definitely, I've, I've had my fair share here in St. Cloud with the team. We have a karaoke machine actually at the house. So I definitely like to sing on that sometimes. Um, and I've been to Europe with my sister, did a lot of singing in the car and, and whatnot there. Didn't have quite as much of a formal audience. But, um, but I also went to China actually in high school. And I think that might be where my love for karaoke came from because we went to a karaoke 
bar, like restaurant thing with our whole group. And you get this whole private room. There's like a stage and a microphone and it's like light shows going on everywhere. So you feel like you're a superstar, like not even <laughs> joking. You go up on stage and, you know, they, their song library is like literally every English Chinese song you could ever ever want to sing so we were singing for I don't know how many hours with the group but it was so much fun and I feel like that's probably where it kind of started but yeah I definitely am not afraid to get on the mic um with uh with the team and have some fun with it too I'm sure I probably scared some of the freshmen away a little bit when I do do sing I'm not the best singer for how much I love it but (laughs) definitely gonna have to sing during the cooking show I want to know how Hannah Bates would assess Emma Paluzny, her singing and her personality. I don't know if this has changed for you, Hannah, but the reason I asked that is because your bio does say you intended to major in psychology at St. Cloud State University. Mm -hmm. Did you stick with the psychology major? Did you change majors? From what we found is a lot of these player bios are made in the freshman year and definitely don't update as time goes along. Yeah, so I am now a business major at psychology because I had some of the classes already done. So I was like, why not? Um, Yeah, so analyzing Poe's karaoke. um, You know, I don't even know what you can say about that. It's like a really unique experience. Uh, Her favorite song is Toxic. Mm. So it's just, I, yeah, I'm kind of like in awe every time I see it. There's some dancing that goes along with it. And I don't have anything else to say. It's it's just a unique experience. And I think only if you see it, you would understand how interesting it is. Toxic. Wow. <laughs> Little Britney Spears up in here. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the only time I get karaoke is if I already have a couple of uh, selected beverages already flowing through my system. Uh, Hannah Bates, uh, what prompted the change uh, from psychology to business? Uh, was there, and I guess I suppose, what was the initial draw to psychology? Because I know that's, it's always been an interest for me just, you know, kind of as a hobby, but, you know, I imagine when you get into some of those classes, they're probably particularly tough. Uh, I guess why make the switch? Um, pretty much I started taking some business classes because I decided to do that as my minor. And then as I kind of went along in the psychology, um, with the psychology classes, I did not want to be a psychologist. I didn't want to be a psychiatrist. And I was like, well, I don't really think I want to do anything in this field. So that's why I ended up switching to business. Um, pretty much this is, this might sound bad, but I didn't really want to listen to people's problems. I like listening to my friend problems and like talking through and like figuring things out, but random people, I just think that would be like a lot to weigh me down. And that is not what I'm about. So yeah, I went with business. Um, just it's, applicable to a lot of things in life and I just really enjoyed it so yeah I might be thinking about um getting an MBA or something in the future so we will see what a what an appointment uh going for uh, psychology would it be just like hey I've got this problem and you know I'm kind of feeling sad or maybe I'm nervous uh, are you the type that would just be kind of I guess short temper be like, well, that's your own fault. I mean, I guess what, what would be the, the Hannah Bates response to, uh, to maybe if I had to walk in and I had some issues going on? Um, I mean, I understand people's problems and I'd want them to feel better, but well, I really, okay. I didn't get that far along in my psychology degree. Uh, so I'm not really sure. I'm very sympathetic towards people, but there's like a point where I'm just, like some people have to figure some things out and that's kind of my thought on it. I, f- I feel like that's kind of like that realist perspective where it's like at some point you just got to kind of suck it up and just deal with the problems. Uh, Emma Pluzny on the flip side, uh, you are listed as a mass communications major. Uh, are you going to switch to the culinary arts or have you still stuck with mass comm? I, I've stuck with mass comm. Unfortunately, there's not a uh, culinary arts degree at St. Cloud State. <laughs> So uh, I missed out on that. Maybe I chose the wrong school. Uh, no, but I'm, I'm a mass comm major and I'm also uh, actually majoring in political science as well. Uh, so I, I kind of decided to double major and 
Um, might even add a communication studies minor. So I'm just trying to make the most of my time here, kind of take classes. And if I've got time, you know, take a couple more and uh, try and get as much as I can out of the education here. Well, well, she's just in the crease and in the classroom. What the heck, man? I don't know how you do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you mentioned too about um, choosing the wrong school because I want to know how you chose the right school, you and Hannah both. Hannah, let's start with you. Uh, what brought you to St. Cloud State? Uh, obviously, you played on a lot of AAA teams, had a really successful uh, pre-college career, I would say, and your college careers went well too. Um, what brought you to St. Cloud State? Was it your your campus visit? Was it uh, the WCHA in general? Why did you want to become a St. Cloud State Husky? Yeah, so I had been to St. Cloud for national camp um, a couple times. So that's kind of like how I learned about it to begin with. And then um, I started talking to St. Cloud probably – I'm thinking like um, before, like before my senior year, because I was like kind of a late commit um, in terms of like when people were committing at the time. Um, so, yeah. So what happened was I was like playing in a tournament um, actually in Michigan. And then they Steve was the D coach at the time and had seen me play. Um, so I was talking with him like quite a bit. And then um, in that, I think after that, I was at a different tournament, but I don't remember where it was at. And Reuter, who was the head coach at the time, um, saw me play. And then we just had been in communication the whole time. And, and I think it wasn't until October that I ended up committing, but yeah, I just liked the, um, like the community feel from St. Cloud, you know, it's, it's not like a big 10 school where you don't, where you'll just be walking around and like, you don't see anyone, you know, um, it's just nice kind of having like the community feel. And when I'm walking around now and stuff, I see people all the time, uh, just other athletes or people I have in class. So like, I really like that. And, and, you know, as I've gone to school here, um, I kind of learned like how nice it really is to have that community. Um, and just, it's easier for myself to like find different things on campus. Like if I'm having a certain like problem or need to like talk to someone, it's just kind of like easier to have the smaller campus. So I love that and I love the coaches. So that's kind of what drew me in. And then on obviously the other side or the back end, if you will, Emma Paluzny, uh, you entered uh, when Janine Alder was getting ready for her sophomore season. Janine, uh, unfortunately, I uh, wasn't able to play most of last year and you had to kind of take over the torch, which I think she kind of helped prepare you for, but Janine, definitely a unique person in her own right. What brought you to St. Cloud State? And then when you first met Janine and kind of saw how introspective she is about the world. I mean, what was that experience like? Yeah, <laughs> I would say I, I was kind of brought to St. Cloud, kind of same same stuff that Hannah was saying. I think the sense of community here is just really, really like amazing, I, probably better than any other team. Um, I, I obviously, I wanted to be in the WCHA. So I, I visited here and I, I loved Steve and Janelle. They were the ones that were recruiting me most of the time you know, walking around for, for visits and whatnot. Uh, I don't know how many hockey players we saw during class passing times, uh, just as we were walking around campus and down to the rink. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really cool, you know, sense of community that we have here. Really great group of girls. Um, I, I think this is probably one of the closer teams that we've had in our last four years. Um, and I like to think that, you know, coming here, we've been able to kind of play a part in growing that team, that culture. Uh, you know, that's something that I, I kind of was interested in as well, trying to actually leave a mark, um, you know, and uh, make a difference for, for the program that I was going to play for. And I thought that St. Cloud was the best bet for, for having that opportunity. And I, uh, you know, I'm, I've been lucky enough to play with Janine for the last three years. And I think she's somebody that taught me a lot. And I think she's taught this whole, this whole group that's been able to play with her quite a bit. You know, she's a really, really smart kid. Um, you know, she was a mass comm major too. So I had plenty of classes with her. And uh, I don't think, you know, she's not very loud, loudly spoken in the locker room, but when she does speak, uh, people listened. And uh, I think she definitely did teach me a lot just in terms of, you know, when I came in as a freshman uh, and even my sophomore year, you know, I was probably pretty immature and uh, I still am. I like to have fun, but, you know, I definitely, uh, I, 
I, she helped me get my feet under me. I think when I got here, kind of just showing me um, how to prepare for games and, and uh, to how to treat hockey. You know, she loved the game more than anything else probably. Um, and, you know, she kind of showed me to respect the game quite a bit too, just in terms of the preparation and uh, being ready to go and uh, give your team the best chance to win each game. You know, it's interesting, Nick, they talk about maturity. Uh, both uh, players with us today were born in the early months of 1999. So if that doesn't make you feel old, I don't know what does. Uh, only a couple more questions from both of us. Uh, and once again, ladies, thank you for joining us. Emma, I have to ask this question and I, and I want you to, um, I mean, I guess you can give me a hockey answer, but I want you to give your legitimate thoughts here. And I, Nick, Nick and I have both talked about this repeatedly on the show, and we're not saying this just because you're here. We truly be believe this. Um, and I think I can speak for Nick when I say this. Uh, you are arguably the best women's hockey goaltender we have ever seen play. I mean, the, the way that your, your work ethic, um, just your fundamentals, uh, you know, quiet feet, all the, all the little things that you do, it's just very, very impressive. And I say that because leading the NCAA in points or in saves last year, not in points, um, but in saves, uh, and not really getting any recognition for that in terms of WCHA accolades, NCAA accolade, accolades and stuff like that. Is there a small part of you that is honestly, uh, I don't know, frustrated or feels like your play has done enough talking to be at least in the conversation as far as some of those, that recognition goes uh, league wide. And I know that, I know that's a very, very loaded question because you're still a player, but I think that your track record has given you enough clout to at least discuss this question and, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but, but I just wanted to pose it because it's a question that Nick and I have had ever since we saw the awards come out uh, in March. Yeah, I'll answer it. I mean, I feel like, so my freshman, my freshman year, I was, you know, I the rookie rookie on the all rookie team or um, that. And then the WCHA all third team haven't been on one since, but I don't really think that that's not really why I play. I, I mean, I think that, you know, being there and, you know, having some experience with the national team even um, and kind of going through all of that, I would say over the last year or so, it's kind of been, I, I don't want to say I've grown up quite a bit in terms of how I think about those sort of things. Uh, but my perspective on it definitely has changed in terms of not really letting those sort of successes kind of define who I am as a player or a person either. I mean, yeah, it's awesome if you can win something, get a trophy, all that sort of thing. But for me personally, I, I'm more so I'm, I play for my teammates. Uh, I play because I love hockey. Um, and, you know, especially right now being in the middle of a pandemic, every time you get to put the skates on, um, you know, I think it's the greatest day ever. I, I think that, you can't really overlook a practice, a lift or anything with your team that you have, especially with the situation that we've been put in this year. Uh, so I, I would say no to answer your question in short after a long winded answer. I don't really care too much. Um, you know, I'm just happy to be playing hockey and uh, getting to be able to, to be with my teammates and, and compete with them every day. And that leads me into my last question of the day. I have one for each of you, and I'll start with Hannah. Hannah, this year, uh, two conference wins to start the season, uh, matching your conference total from last year. You guys, uh, I feel like you're a faster team, uh, just a lot more poise and control with the puck. Obviously, that uh, freshman group becoming a sophomore group has been really beneficial uh, with Clara Himmlerova, Olivia Savar, Taylor Lind, and the like leading the way. And then your incoming freshman class, highlighted by Emma Gentry, has been impressive too. Um, and let's not forget the senior class, looking pretty good as well too right uh how how have you felt about the season thus far uh, how how the team has been able to take strides and uh also about sonia hola uh, in her first game when emma was not in action uh pitching a shutout in her first game in a huskies uniform yeah so it's been um a lot of fun to get to see the freshmen every year it's fun to see the freshmen and kind of how they're going to do in their first games because we had so long to practice this year uh three months before getting to play a game. So we were all amped up and excited to see what they were going to be able to, to do in the game. So yeah, Gentry is really fun to watch. She's always working hard out there and um, she gets the pucks to the net. Obviously she's already had, I think two goals. So it's been really fun to watch her play and it'll be exciting to see her 
progressed through this year and everything. Also, it's been fun, um, you know, just kind of seeing how the sophomores have grown even from last year and helping kind of the freshmen with uh, this and gentry and stuff, just how they work together and, and have matured even over this, this last year. So I am excited for the rest of the Husky season. Um, it's the year of the Husky women. I don't know if, if you guys know that, but we know it. So we're excited <laughs> for the rest of the year and to play Minnesota um, the first of the year. Yeah. And I, Nick and I have talked about that too. We believe in this group and I feel like that um, this group does have a lot of potential that we believe is, has been untapped thus far and is ready to uh, re- ready to come to the forefront. Uh, Emma, I, I kind of mentioning uh, Sonny as well, I obviously played well in her first game in her freshman year. I mean, can you think back to your freshman year and, and your first game, you actually pitched a win against UConn, a three to two win in that contest. But uh, um, you know, h- how happy were you for her? And then looking forward uh, to the season as well, how different was it as well? Not only bringing in obviously a new goaltender in her, but just a really weird off season with the COVID cup and just not a normal routine. Uh, how nice was it to finally settle in and get a couple of games in, in Duluth after seeing Sonny have so much su- success? Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, looking back at my my first game against UConn, I told Sonny about it too. Uh, I don't know if it was on the Thursday before we played Mankato or morning of at morning skate. And I told her, you know, there's a good chance that you're going to do better than I did on my first, uh, in my first collegiate game. I actually let in the first two shots on goal. I faced (laughs) against UConn. Um, I I don't remember how they went in, but I just remember thinking, Oh my gosh, I'm probably going to get pulled in my first ever career start. I'm not even going to make it out of the first five minutes of the the first period. Um, Luckily Ruder left me in there. I'm sure he was probably scared out of his mind too, thinking, Oh dear Lord, this little freshman already let in two goals and we're not very far into this. Um, but, uh, I told her about that and said, you know, it's, it's pretty much, you know, you, you're going to do better than I am. And uh, you just got to kind of make one save at a time and watching her get that shutout and like the whole team, I think, uh, we were definitely a bit shorthanded, you know, that we were, we didn't have uh, a full group out there, uh, just because of COVID protocols and things like that. Uh, but watching them play all of them, I was just like, this is amazing. It was my first game that I had had to watch from the stands. Um, and it was definitely a fun game to watch and to see Sonny pitch a shutout first game. I was like, man, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, much deserved. She's a really hard worker competitor in practice. I mean, she reminds me a little bit of myself when I was a freshman. I remember I, I would play out every rebound. I would, um, you know, be battling and competing, you know, every second of every practice. And she definitely reminds me of that a little bit. I feel like in my old age, it's, it's been a little bit tougher sometimes after a hard weekend series coming in on Monday and, and playing every rebound. Um, but definitely I would say with those freshmen coming in, I think they really bring, you know, a, a spirit of, of passion, I would say too, that I think you get every year when a bunch of freshmen come in, they're just really excited to be here, uh, to be a part of the team and kind of figure everything out. Um, you know, just as, as uh, everybody does when they go to college. So I'm really excited for the year. Um, I think we got a really great group, really great group in the locker room, a lot of skill, um, definitely a lot of speed. You know, we've had a really great time in from over the past uh, semester here working with um, uh, two, two new strength coaches that we've got in um, Nate and Jake, they do a great job. And, and I think they definitely did a good job of preparing us for, for that weekend and uh, here moving into the second half. In, in in her old age, she says, Nick, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how to feel about that. I guess, sorry, Nick, I always do this. I always have a follow-up question on my last question. Emma, when is the last time you've actually sat in the stands to watch a hockey game? Curious question. That, yeah, that was the first time in my college career. And I don't know. I don't think I... I missed one game in high school and that was because I threw up all over the nurse's floor office. I was sick and I still went to school. I remember it was like first period. I like made it 20 minutes into first period. I was like, Oh no. So I start running to the nurse's office and I didn't make it. I threw up all over the nurse's floor, but that was the last game that I think I probably had to miss. Knock on wood. I've been, been, been blessed with good health, but um, I feel like, yeah, it was definitely a weird experience. And then when, um, we, we played Duluth. That was my first time coming in like cold too. So that was, I've had a couple firsts already here this year, but yeah. Uh-huh. 
Uh, my last question, uh, Hannah, I want to go to you is, you know, the way the season has been structured, you know, you kind of have a first half and there's a break and then you have a second half. Uh, you, you guys were playing well. Again, we talk about it here the last uh, few minutes is that, you know, we have a, a belief in this group. You guys feel like hey, you're making strides and, you know, last year's definitely far behind you guys. But is there a part of you guys that wishes that there wasn't this break that you could just keep playing and keep building momentum to try to keep things trending in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's always fun to keep the momentum going and and keep building on what you've been able to, I mean, accomplish in the first six games here. So, I mean, I think that it's important, but I also think that we were a little bit beat up and just the first six games kind of took a toll on our team. So I think it'll also be a good break to just let everyone heal and, and then come back fresh and ready to go for the first weekend. Um, and also, it's been a while since some people have been home, probably three plus months. So I think it'll just like kind of rejuvenate everyone and and that we'll be able to come back stronger. And um, like Paul said, we have our strength coaches, um, Jake and Nate, who have um, all our workouts set up on our apps and stuff. So we'll still be working out, still be um, – ready to go when we come back. So it, I just think it'll be a good break though for us. And then uh, Emma just going to kind of twist the question a little bit. Uh, as Hannah said, you know, maybe a good thing to have a little break, but how do you reset your focus after a break like this and try to, again, not lose any of that uh, positive gains that you guys had over the first six games? Yeah, I feel like over break, it, it can definitely be tough. Uh, when you first get back on campus, your head can sometimes still be at home, um, you know, spending time with family and stuff like that. It's uh, definitely something where, you know, when you go to the rink every day, you got kind of have to check yourself and make sure that you're, uh, you're there in that moment going to the rink to play hockey rather than thinking about something else. But I would say in, in general, I think that once we get back uh, kind of, you know, right after Christmas, I think that we'll be uh, able to bounce back pretty quick just because of the, the stuff that I think everybody's doing away from the rink right now, uh, taking care of themselves if that's what they need, uh, working out if that's what they need. But definitely something where, you know, I think that uh, having a good couple first skates once we're back, once we've all been tested uh, and come back negative, hopefully, um, it's definitely something where I, I think we're pretty hungry right now, especially after a pretty good first half for us, you know, it was cut short because of COVID, but I think we're all just kind of grateful to be in the, the situation that we have to have a second half year and uh, be able to keep going. Imagine that Nick, Emma Paluzny says that she's hungry. Imagine that one. Right. Emma, <laughs> <laughs> Emma Paluzny and Hannah Bates again. Thank you so much for joining us. It is finals week. So good luck on those. And uh, again, good luck on the rest of the season. So uh, we'll be definitely watching you guys. We wish you the best of luck. And we, we definitely think that you guys are going to do some good things. So again, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Take the Huskies Warming House podcast wherever you go. Find the newest episodes or listen to your favorite on iTunes and Podbean. Get all the latest news and updates at huskieswarminghousepodcast.com and look for our Facebook page, the Huskies Warming House podcast, as well as our Twitter feed, at Warming House Den. Our Twitter feed will host trivia updates and questions for fans as well as a mailbag where you can tweet us anytime with your questions, concerns, or listener suggestion. And for business inquiries, email us at huskieswarminghousepodcast at outlook.com. And once again, thank you to both Emma Paluzny and Hannah Bates for joining us. Loved that conversation. No, again, two really, really good hockey players here for the St. Cloud State women's program and hoping to see them here in the second half of the season to continue uh, that push upwards in the WCHA standings. Yeah, really uh, happy to have them on. Uh, it's been a, probably a long time coming, especially for Emma Paluzny having her on as well. But Hannah's a really good friend of mine and a friend of the show, obviously, as well. And speaking of a friend of the show, uh, just a heads up for our listeners, we will have, uh, at least tentatively right now, Bill Prout uh, of Center ISU joining us for the final episode of 2020 to kind of recap the pod and go through those sorts of things. So excited to have him on as well. And I'm sure he'll help us digest some uh, three-on-three overtime woes that uh, particularly may have been going on for the Huskies this week.
Yeah, I think so. Speaking of three on three overtime, Noah, I, th I there was a, a huge lash on social media um, out after last night's contest. And again, I was calling the game on KBSC. Um, I was able to watch the feed. I don't know how many people have NCHC TV, um, whether you know they were able to actually see the play develop. Um, but lots of folks angry and upset because, well, I guess they got beat by North Dakota in overtime, and it only took them eight seconds. That somehow three and three overtime is dumb. And uh, we're definitely going to get into a deep dive on this. Uh, the only thing I will say just real quick before we kind of get into deep discussion is first of all, calm your emotions, people uh, it, it's in North Dakota. Number one. Yes. We all want to beat them at everything and every time, but North Dakota is, is it's got, they're a good hockey team. And unfortunately with the three players that were there on the ice, Jordan Kawaguchi, Shane Pinto and Jacob Bernard Docker, those guys, uh, you know, all probably could be future pro players. Uh, they executed it. Uh, unfortunately after what was honestly, Noah, a face-off mistake by the Huskies. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't really overshadow uh, the rural outcry that was there. And that is, why do we have to go to three on three? Why isn't there five on five? But yes, it was a change. But remember, we had three and three overtime the last couple of years from the NCHC. Yes, there was a five on five minute overtime just because the NCAA rules made it so, but the NCAA changed it. So now it's only one uh, five minute three on three overtime and then a best of three shootout, then going into the sudden death if nobody scores from there. Uh, and I guess my first thought, Noah, is, Oh, three and three overtime. Again, this is college hockey. This is a developmental league, which means why would you do something that the pro teams slash leagues are not doing? That was actually the big reason why Josh Fenton and some other uh, college hockey folks lobbied to get rid of the five on five. And that is how can, how can these kids uh, attract NHL, you know, type scouts or NHL uh, and I guess management and executives, if we're using a system in overtime that they're not using, honestly, you got to remember too, these are young kids. They're going to make mistakes. And at the end of it, you still have to put it out there. They have to adjust and uh, you know, say what you want about eight seconds. Uh, but if you watch the play and I know you and I both did, and that is, you know, in the game of hockey, when there's less people on the ice, mistakes are magnified. And unfortunately, in this situation, not only was the mistake magnified, but you have a very smart, very good player in Jordan Kawaguchi, where I could see some players, maybe not to his hockey IQ level, would maybe try to rush that play. Instead, he allowed it to develop. He took advantage of a player from North Dakota, Shane Pinto, driving it. He wanted behind him, shut again across the grain into uh, above the glove of David Arenek, who didn't seem to be quite ready for the shot necessarily, at least from my eye points. Uh, but either way, it's a perfect shot in a beautifully executed play there off of a bad faceoff play by the Huskies. But again, you have to, this is the a learning moment. Again, if you want to be a Sam Henches, that is a Minnesota Wild draft pick. If you're going to be Nick Pervix, a Tampa Bay Lightning draft pick for David Arenek, a LA Kings draft pick. This is something you'll have to face if you're going to be signed to the National Hockey League, AHL, ECHL, what have you. So I like the fact that three on three overtime is there. And unfortunately, the Huskies just haven't been able to find either if system or just, you know, something where they just haven't been as successful in this. But again, every time that you fall down is a opportunity to learn and get back up and do better the next time. So it's here to stay. It should be that way. And to me, again, just a bad play in this particular instance that led to North Dakota taking advantage of it. Yeah. So let's kind of go back to some of the things that uh, we had kind of noticed or have seen through the social media world here. Uh, the first point, which you touched on very, very well, is that, uh, oh, it was an interference play. It was a pick play by the North Dakota player. No, it wasn't. And just because the two Husky players ran into each other and looked goofy in the end, well, Look out, make a better play. Here's the other thing too. And, and I'm glad you mentioned again, once again, David Rennick there and why he gets beat on that play. Cause Jordan Kawaguchi, I mean, was fairly far out from, from the net. I mean, it wasn't an in tight shot, but boy, it was an absolute laser. Um, and one would, uh, a couple of people would say it had to be him, but I don't know if it had to be him anyway. So <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not throwing shade at all, but I will say this though, just, just to recap, if you are a North Dakota fan, there probably isn't a player that you would want more to have that shot than Jordan Kawaguchi. That was his fifth career overtime. And as I believe, if I remember seeing the stack correctly, his 10th career game winning goal. So again, he's got a knack for making yep. a clutch play when it's needed most. Yep. And you have to think about that because I forget who was driving the net there. Uh, as you Shane Pinto. Yep. Shane Pinto, Ottawa senators draft pick there. And, uh, 
um, I believe Shane Pinto, he's a right-handed shot. So he's yes, driving, he driving towards the net on the, on his on hand there. So if you're David Rennick, uh, what you're taught in goaltending here, and if I can kind of demonstrate and talk through it at the same time, uh, you don't want to, if my legs are underneath, you want your arms to be tucked in and you want to kind of start from the bottom where your pad is and then keep your hand up. So essentially your hand is in between so you can go down or up, you know, at a halfway point where you can react well to shots that are, you know, lower than your arm or higher than your arm. I know that sounds obvious to a lot of people, but some people don't know how goaltenders hold their hands, but it's important in this situation because of this. If Shane Pinto was not driving the net here, I think David Rennick makes that save all day because he does not have that backdoor threat here. And with Shane Pinto driving his way through like he did and the two Husky players running into each other, that play could have easily, just as easily been Jordan Kawaguchi to Shane Pinto on that diagonal slap pass, if you will, or shot pass redirected in back door. So I think um, Rennick was kind of banking on, um, well, both my defensemen are now out of the play. Normally the defensemen take the pass and I take the shot. Well, now the bigger threat is actually that pass and that bang, bang play. Cause what is the fastest thing that moves on the ice, a pass, uh, you know, from, a puck so i think rennick was almost anticipating that that pass is going to be made and kept his hands a little bit lower and almost anticipated that that play was going to be lower and then kawaguchi goes upstairs and beats him so what looks like a play that maybe rennick should have had i think that's where that stems from I want to jump in real quick, Noah, because you make some really good points here, and this is very brief. Um, once those two defensemen run in, it's now a 2 on 0 yep. And so for a goaltender, you mentioned, again, if you have a defenseman that at least has Pinto tied up, again, he can just literally focus in on the shot, right? But now with Kawaguchi and Pinto ahead of the play, now he's left in between. And as a goaltender, the worst thing you can do is be in a spot where you have to make a decision at the last second instead of committing to something, whether it's the pass or the shot. Absolutely. And the other part of this that we talked about and leading up to uh, the ire of a lot of fans essentially is them saying three on three is dumb or three on three is not hockey. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. They're, so, 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 so they're let, gonna let, say let, Huskies fans would say three on three is the best if they had won that, honestly. So they I saw some, I saw some people say that too, where they would say, I would say that even if the Huskies had won. So, so here's what, here's what I have to say from, you know, take take the St. Cloud and North Dakota thing out of the equation here. Pretend it's I, I don't know Florida and the New York Islanders. That would be a boring hockey game. But um, <laughs> so pretend they're playing three on three. What is three on three? Three on three is, and even more so four on four because I think four on four is probably the most probably the best mix of speed and skill versus still normal hockey, close to five on five, if you will. What is three on three and four on four emulate? And you touched on it a little bit earlier. It's pond hockey. It's uh, it's it's a numbers game. It's understanding you know where cerebrally you have to be on the ice because you think about three on three. How many three on three game winners have we seen where you know somebody comes in on a two on one and the goalie makes a great save or the guy blows a tire and all of a sudden boom it's a two on zero oh back the other direction. Well, what happens in these number situations when you shrink? those you know quantities from five on five to four on four to three on three every single mistake or decision both good or bad is amplified that much more you know three on three and four on four that's man on man if it's four on four um depends on what people run but generally it's two forwards two defensemen forwards have the dd have the forwards three on three um the whole point is to try to make some sort of what do you guess a scissor play almost what North Dakota ran where it's a crossing pattern where even if you don't get somebody to bite, you have to force a defender to make a decision and decide, am I going to take this guy? Am I going to take this guy? And as we saw evidence in the game with the Huskies, the two defenders actually ran into each other because they were too busy trying to decide that, you know, decision. That is what three on three hockey is. It's this wide open, fast paced puck possession oriented, um, it's it's the epitome of what the skill of the game of hockey is. I know a lot of people, you know, love the grit and the tenacity and the battle that comes with five on five, you know, overtime NHL Stanley Cup final hockey. And I'm totally there with you. But in terms of regular season play, if you want a game to end quickly, you want a game to end in a way that's exciting and a game that and, and in a way that still stays true to what the premise and skill and speed of today's game of hockey 
um, you know, exemplifies, that's what three on three hockey is. So from a pure hockey standpoint to say that three on three is not hockey, it's like, I don't want to say it's doing a disservice to the game, but it's like, it's, it's putting your ego before the objective nature of how the game of hockey is played. Honestly, I, and I'm sorry if that offends people, but you know, from you and I as hockey guys, it's kind of like, dude, three on three is the coolest thing on planet earth. And that's coming from wild fans who suck at three on three. Yeah. And until maybe this year with uh, Kaprizov joining the lineup, I, I cannot wait to see what he has yep. uh, in store in a wild sweater, uh, but everything he laid out was perfect. Um, I want to visualize a couple of things for, for our fans. If this is the goal, and this was the center ice area. Here's what ended up happening. Fitzgerald, who was the winger. Again, it was, I believe it was Nolan Walker that was a center. And then Nick Perbix was a defenseman. Faceoff was essentially kind of a tie-up. Then the puck, uh, it looks like Fitzgerald thought that it had gone forward. So he was anticipating. Unfortunately, it was Shane Pinto that came forward. And then Jack Kawaguchi actually has the puck. As he entered the zone, Fitzgerald recognizes he's now behind the play, right? So he's coming through the middle. He showed Nick Perbix is shadowing Kawaguchi here. And he's actually pointing. You can see him pointing his glove. He's got it. Kawaguchi sees that, okay, allows Shane Pinto to go in front of him. As soon as he does that, Fitzgerald has essentially caught up to him, but then he cuts to the middle. This is that scissor play we talk about. What happens here is Fitzgerald is so fixated on that, that he is keeping his eye right on Pinto as he should, but now it almost, you could call it a pick play, but the pick is, again, when you're behind as the defending forward, it doesn't matter because it's not, your two players blocking them. It's the, the Huskies defenders blocking each other. Kawaguchi ran it perfectly. And then they do block. And then now you have Kawaguchi coming around the right-hand side there. He's got time and space. And again, with Pinto on front, there's your two on And again, in hockey, uh, I don't think we, the fans who are casual know, understand that how much a half of a second or a half a step behind yep. is huge in the game of hockey. You don't need that much time and space. And for Kawaguchi, Timing of the shot also, right? He takes that turn and then right where I guess you would anticipate it. And I think for hockey players, it is almost second nature, right? Where you just know when to pull the trigger. And um, for David Rennick there, again, he understands it. I either have to take the shot or the pass. I have no idea. At that point, he's long out, he's hung out to dry. And at that point, you know, let's just, let's just rewind the clocks here a little bit. If Perbix and Fitzgerald do not click bodies there. And again, he lost maybe a half a step and that's it. He's able to stay with him, at least lead it with a stick and force Kawaguchi out more wide. Now the angle becomes worse. Potentially he does not have a shot that he likes. Maybe he tries to force one into the weak side there, but for David Rennick, he's able to square up, maybe even become more aggressive. And the, maybe that play doesn't even happen. So again, it's not much in three on three hockey. As you mentioned, everything is magnified in terms of mistake or body contact. And this is, was the unfortunate scenario for the Huskies. And again, with those two players, again, world-class athletes here for college hockey, they make you pay every time. So, um, I get, you, know, you know, and, and my, my final point here, um, and I'm glad you mentioned about the timing thing here, because what do we notice about that play? I know we're dissecting this um, quite a bit here, but I think it's warranted to, to kind of understand what a hockey player sees, you know, put yourself in Kawaguchi's shoes here, which boy, I would love to have that set of wheels on the bottom right. of my feet. Um, but so the play essentially develops from right to left back to right, if that makes any sense, because the shot or a pass to Shane Pinto comes back to the right here. But what happens here? Anytime you have time and space as a shooter, most of the game of hockey, um, believe it or not, the goal is to go north-south because it's so hard to pick your way through the zone, especially in five-on-five -five hockey and less or so in four-on-four -four hockey and then three-on-three -three hockey. That's where you start to see more of that east-west. There you have players who are creating crossing patterns going across. So let's say the two Husky defenders, defenders do not clip each other, but you still have this melee of bodies in front where Kawaguchi is coming from the right across as a left-handed shot. So he's got he's pretty much opened up with a really nice shooting angle because his stick is in the middle of the ice, if that makes sense. So if you have these two Husky defenders, one coming back and the other crossing over, trying to stay with Shane Pinto, and Shane Pinto is just coming through the middle, well, at that point, Kawaguchi might not even decide to go wide. He might decide to try to shoot through a screen and through that melee of bodies against the grain and use that screen to his advantage. So you talk about three-on-three -three hockey and how cerebral it is. Even if the Husky players don't collide in with each other, Shane Pinto can still be a guy that creates a ton of havoc just by 
being there, being there. Yeah. just just by creating a crossing pattern where he forces David Rennick to have to look through a screen and that sort of thing. And Nick, where does this play all start? And a couple of Husky fans were on this and they were absolutely correct about this one. And re- with regard to puck possession, face-off is important. Face-offs mm-hmm. are very, very pivotal. And the Huskies last week were at 54% on the draw. This week they have dropped down to 47.8% in the pond. So you talk about the Huskies losing a little bit in the dot as well. So all of those things come into play uh, it, when you open up that ice sheet with a lot more time and space. And a lot, and my final point too, to wrap this up is, you know, a lot of it isn't just winning the faceoff between the centers. It's that secondary help too. Again, mm-hmm. I mentioned Kevin Fitzgerald because he's a very good, smart hockey player, but again, it looks like he just lost sight of it. I think he anticipated that it was one back. And so he stepped in front and unfortunately it was in still in the feet of Shane Pinto. And then he turns around and then again, he's already behind the play. And again, we talk about game uh, hockey is a game of inches. At this point, it was a game of a half of a stride. If, Fitzgerald reads that and backs off. I don't even think we're talking about eight seconds at all. So yes, you're right. Absolutely. Face off and centers matter, but also that secondary support there uh, where Fitzgerald, they said goes ahead instead of going back behind. It doesn't read the play. A big reason why Kawaguchi is able to make the play that he does. Yeah. The players without the puck are often more important than the guys with the puck. If you watch the modern game of hockey, it's all about where can the puck carry and move the puck next. And what are my teammates doing for me? So uh, yeah, hopefully the Huskies can bounce back, get back on track. I know some people were kind of frustrated too about uh, uh, the Huskies ability to quote unquote, be ready. The Huskies were the better team against North Dakota through much of that game. Um, they just didn't grab a balance. There've been a couple games where they probably should have won that they didn't show up, but you're not going to be on every night. I like Sidney Crosby and Connor McDavid are not on every night, although almost every night, but you know, hockey teams in general, you know, they ebb and flow just with momentum and that sort of thing, just like anybody does. I mean, that's just, that's just how it works. So Huskies fans, Stick with it. Stay in there. We're going to be covering it with you and checking in along with you to make sure our Huskies are doing the best that they can. And we'll keep you up to date on what we see from our perspective as well. We thank you once again for joining us for episode number 41. Don't forget episode 42, our Christmas special will be our last episode of 2020. No trivia next week. And then off to the new year, potentially some changes. Don't forget to check out our poll as well that will be released in the coming days from when we are recording this episode about some changes to the show. And above all, have a wonderful holiday season from the Huskies Warming House podcast. 